This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Governor Salmon P. Chase and Missouri's distinguished elder statesman Edward Bates. Taken together, the lives of these four men give us a picture of the path taken by ambitious young men in the North who came of age in the early decades of the 19th century. All four studied law, became distinguished orators, entered politics, and opposed the spread of slavery. Their upward climb was one followed by many thousands who left the small towns of their birth to seek opportunity and adventure in the rapidly growing cities of a dynamic, expanding America. Just as a hologram is created through the interference of light from separate sources, so the lives and impressions of those who companioned Lincoln give us a clearer and more dimensional picture of the President himself. Lincoln's barren childhood, his lack of schooling, his relationships with male friends, his complicated marriage, the nature of his ambition, and his ruminations about death can be analyzed more clearly when he is placed side by side with his three contemporaries. When Lincoln won the nomination, each of his celebrated rivals believed the wrong man had been chosen. Ralph Waldo Emerson recalled his first reception of the news that the comparatively unknown name of Lincoln had been selected. We heard the result coldly and sadly. It seemed too rash on a purely local reputation, to build so grave a trust in such anxious times. Lincoln seemed to have come from nowhere, a backwoods lawyer who had served one undistinguished term in the House of Representatives and had lost two consecutive contests for the U.S. Senate. Contemporaries and historians alike have attributed his surprising nomination to chance, the fact that he came from the battleground state of Illinois and stood in the center of his party. The comparative perspective suggests a different interpretation. When viewed against the failed efforts of his rivals, it is clear that Lincoln won the nomination because he was shrewdest and canniest of them all. More accustomed to relying upon himself to shape events, he took the greatest control of the process leading up to the nomination, displaying a fierce ambition, an exceptional political acumen, and a wide range of emotional strengths, forged in the crucible of personal hardship, that took his unsuspecting rivals by surprise. That Lincoln, after winning the presidency, made the unprecedented decision to incorporate his eminent rivals into his political family, the cabinet, was evidence of a profound self-confidence and a first indication of what would prove to others a most unexpected greatness. Seward became Secretary of State, Chase, Secretary of the Treasury, and Bates, Attorney General. The remaining top posts Lincoln offered to three former Democrats, whose stories also inhabit these pages. Gideon Wells, Lincoln's Neptune, was made Secretary of the Navy, Montgomery Blair became Postmaster General, and Edwin M. Stanton, Lincoln's Mars, eventually became Secretary of War. Every member of this administration was better known, better educated, and more experienced in public life than Lincoln. Their presence in the Cabinet might have threatened to eclipse the obscure prairie lawyer from Springfield. It soon became clear, however, that Abraham Lincoln would emerge the undisputed captain of this most unusual cabinet, truly a team of rivals. The powerful competitors who had originally disdained Lincoln became colleagues who helped him steer the country through its darkest days. Seward was the first to appreciate Lincoln's remarkable talents, quickly realizing the futility of his plan to relegate the president to a figurehead role. In the months that followed, Seward would become Lincoln's closest friend and advisor in the administration. 
Though Bates initially viewed Lincoln as a well-meaning but incompetent administrator, he eventually concluded that the president was an unmatched leader, very near being a perfect man.